The Demonic Influence of National Sovereignty by the Marquis of Lothian, Philip Kerr. Few people seem to realize the far-reaching and demonic effects which the almost universal acceptance of national sovereignty as the basis of our present-day world order has both in producing war and in making impossible fidelity to the moral law or the Christian principle both in international and in increasing spheres of national life. It is no exaggeration to say that unless it can be overcome, it will be difficult to avoid the catastrophes prophesied in Mr. H. G. Wells' book, The Shape of Things to Come. It is commonplace that without quote, law and order, no organized civilized life for individuals can exist. Without the reign of law, man becomes preoccupied with the defense of himself, his family, his home, and his food supply. The might of the club or the gun is able to overrule justice and so make peaceful cooperative life and liberty impossible. It is exactly the same on the larger stage of the world as a whole. Anarchy forces nations to think first and last about themselves, and especially about their own security, exalts might above right, makes war indigenous, and so destroys the possibility of a civilized and Christian society among men. There never has been a time when war was not the constant on the earth. A long peace endured when great empires like the Roman, or the Chinese, or the Mughal empires established law and order over great areas and vast numbers of the human race. But despotic empires of this kind contain within themselves the seed of their own decay, because they atrophied the independence, the initiative, and the public spirit of their citizens by requiring blind obedience to authority, and corrupted their rulers with arbitrary and absolute power. But the shrinkage in time and space through the discoveries of modern science has made the demonic and destructive power of anarchy infinitely more savage and powerful than ever before, and the need to overcome it correspondingly urgent. 2. People often accuse nationalism of being the cause of war, but it is necessary to distinguish between nationality and nationalism. Nationality has been fundamentally a healthy movement. It has encouraged self-respect and the desire for freedom from external oppression, and it has stimulated unity in public spirit as against individual selfishness and parochial narrowness. It is not easy to define with precision the basis of nationality. It is a compound of race, language, culture, religion, and geography. It is the recognition of the fact that while civilization may be becoming one in the sense that the whole world is adopting the same modes of daily living and is becoming interested in the same things, it is vital that there be a variety and individuality within it. But if nationality may be described as individuality, nationalism is egotism, the worship of the national self carrying with it fear and hatred of or indifference to other nations. The evil springs likely from the identification of nationality with the sovereign state when, as we shall see, it becomes subject to all the other baleful pressures of selfishness, arrogance, imperialism, fear, suspicion, hatred, and war, which inevitably impinge upon those who live under the conditions of anarchy. 3. Others accuse capitalism of being the cause of war. This is not the place to discuss the rival merits of the individualist and the socialist ideals. One of the main tasks of this century is clearly to discover some working synthesis between individual initiative and liberty in the collective good of the community as a whole. But it is profoundly untrue to regard capitalism as the main cause of war, or socialism as a remedy for war. Capitalism does not produce war inside the state, nor would it produce war inside a world state. Capitalism, indeed, is an international force. Businessmen have few racial and national prejudices when it comes to matters of business. Left to itself, the capitalist system would rapidly link the whole world in a single economic structure, Admittedly, capitalism does not distribute wealth evenly or justly, hence the necessity for social reform to mitigate the effects of competition on the individual and to equalize living conditions through the taxing system. But it is national sovereignty which twists capitalism as it twists nationality into an element of international discord. It is the existence of the sovereign state which long precedes modern capitalism, which on the one hand produces economic nationalism with its constant dislocation of international economic life by tariffs, embargoes, quotas, subsidies, and prohibitions, and on the other hand induces businessmen to try to capitalize patriotism for their own ends and influence the machinery of the sovereign state to secure privileges and concessions as against their rivals in other states or to establish imperialist control over other countries. Capitalism aggravates the risk of war but the root cause of war lies in sovereignty and not capitalism. These evils would not disappear, though they would change their form, if all nations were to become socialist states tomorrow. The anarchy of national sovereignty would still produce its fatal effects. Few of them would be self-supporting. 
Those that were self-supporting would be peaceful as the countries with the largest territories are peaceful today, but the prosperity, employment, and rising standard of the rest would depend on their being able to exchange their own surplus products for the exact things which they needed to import from other countries. The task of negotiating agreements between 70 sovereign states so that the imports and exports of each would fit with the needs of all the rest especially when one considers that such agreements would necessarily involve changes in the occupations and dwelling place of millions of families would be extremely difficult. It might well produce as much tension and risk of war as is caused by the interference of the sovereign state in the automatic adjustment of supply and demand through the operation of the price system in a capitalist economy. The truth is that it is the sovereign state in neither capitalism nor socialism which is the principal root of the modern drift towards war, and we are far more likely to arrive at a rational approach to the socialist-individualist controversy when we realize the prodigious effect upon both of international anarchy. 5. Yet the state in itself is a wholly beneficent, indeed an entirely indispensable institution. Its primary function is to establish and maintain peace, or as it sometimes is called, law and order. Peace, in the political sense of the word, is a positive thing. It is that organic form of society in which political, economic, and social issues are settled by the enactment of law, applied and interpreted by the courts, and in which resort to violence or war as a means of settling disputes is prohibited and prevented. Peace, in this sense, does not just happen. It is the creation of a specific political institution. That institution is the state. The state is the instrument which enables human beings to end war and begin to lead a civilized life. Never from the beginning of recorded history, nor on any part of the earth's surface, has there been peace kept except within a state. The state may be a primitive tribal rulership in Africa, or a vast system of republics integrated by the Communist Party like Soviet Russia. It may be an advanced democratic republic like the United States, a totalitarian dictatorship like National Socialist Germany, or a placid constitutional monarchy like Sweden. It may be a brutal tyranny or a benevolent republic. It may be managed in the interest of the ruler, or an aristocratic caste, or by the bourgeoisie, or the proletariat, or of all people voting at parliamentary elections. But in every case, peace and what flows from peace, the possibility of justice, freedom, and the increasing welfare of the people, only appears when the state appears. Until the state appears, there is only anarchy and violence, in private or public war. No other institution has been devised as a substitute for the state, because the coming into being of the state is the ending of private war and violence, in the substitution for them of the reign of law. The essence of the state is not contract, it is dedication. The individual cannot contract out of his duties as a citizen. Wherever he goes, he is a citizen or subject of some state. He is bound to obey the law, or he goes to jail. He is bound to pay the prescribed taxes, or his money is forcibly taken from him. He is bound to help to support the law and the policemen. The state, as Hegel said, is in a measure the recognition of the fact that we are members one of another, parts of a society which is not a mere fortuitous aggregation of unrelated atoms, but an organic whole. That is why he regarded it as an almost divine institution, which it is not. The extent to which justice, liberty, and well-being flow from the state depends upon its form, and there are many forms of state, and the kind of society which will exist and whether it subserves the interest of some or all of the people will depend on who in fact controls its executive, legislative, and judicial machinery in the spirit to which animates them. They may be a monarch or an aristocracy, the elected majorities in a democratic state, or the dictatorial parties of fascist or communist states, but there can be neither justice nor liberty nor well-being as there can be no peace except where the state in one of its forms exists. The state, however, does not eschew violence. On the contrary, it claims that it alone is entitled to use violence. It could not, indeed, exist without the use of violence. It habitually uses violence. Moreover, the violence it uses is irresistible violence. A great number of laws it enacts and the changes which it brings about are inevitably objected to by individuals or sections of the community. They are often obeyed by minorities only because they know that disobedience involves fines, imprisonment, or death. Yet if the state did not enforce the law and do so irresistibly, individuals and groups would inevitably begin to use violence or fraud to defend or promote their own rights or interest, and society itself would dissolve in anarchy. In one sense, therefore, the state is violence, but violence only used in accordance with law and in a democratic and constitutional state as a result of an electoral decision by a majority of its citizens. 5. It is because of these tremendous powers inherent in all states that the evils of interstate anarchy are so terrible. For in a conflict of states, the whole population of each and all of its assets are flung as a unit into a struggle. Let us examine first the economic consequences. 
The discoveries of natural science and the Industrial Revolution have placed in the hands of man the possibility of plenty for all. The essence of the process was invention of the machine in new sources of power, the division of labor, the specialization of the task of the individual working man, and by means of capital obtained from private subscribers, and through competent management, the assembly of raw materials from all over the earth into a factory, in the sale by competent salesmanship, also all over the earth, of the resultant product. The early days of the Industrial Revolution were marked with immense profits and large losses for capital, and with terrible hardships for workers driven or drawn from the land, and often herded in towns in wretched dwellings, and working for excessive hours, and in noisome factories. Nonetheless, conditions were gradually improved in most countries by factory acts, social insurance against unemployment, and sickness for old age, trade unionism, universal education, and so forth. And it's generally agreed that in Western Europe the standard of living of mankind rose no less than fourfold during the 19th century. But if this rise in standards was to continue, free trade, freedom for migration, freedom for the movement of capital, where necessary, as well as a great increase in the regulatory and supervisory activities of government under the general head of social reform, the organization of the economic resources of the world required immense supplies of capital, a prodigious migration of population, the development of raw materials and markets in all parts of the globe, the uninterrupted exchange of food, raw materials, and manufactured articles, as well as an increasing social conscience to ensure that the fruits of this enterprise were properly shared, and laws for the protection of labor were passed and enforced. During a considerable part of the 19th century, this free economy existed in greater or less degree, but gradually it has been destroyed through intervention of the sovereign state. Whether the alleged motive was to protect the standard of living of workers who had machinery at their disposal against the competition of low-paid workers who had little save their hands, and vice versa, or to increase the profits of the employer, or to ensure the nearest approximation to self-sufficiency in a time of war, or to offset the consequences of one-way traffic necessary to meet the extravagant international indebtedness, especially payments for the reparation of war debts, it has been the action of the sovereign state which has profoundly dislocated the pre-war economy by means of tariffs, embargoes, quotas, prohibitions, and finally the destruction of the old international currency based on gold. The sovereign state, thinking of itself, indeed unable by the law of its own self-centered being to think of the world, or of humanity as a whole, took action, supposedly in its own interest, which produced the worst depression ever known, enlarged the total number of unemployed to 30 millions in 1931, completely destroyed the old world balance between the supply and demand, ruined millions of farmers in some parts of the world, while ruining countless businesses and throwing out of work millions of workers most anxious to consume the farmers' products in other parts, and out of the enormous social tension so set up has sprung every kind of domestic disorder which has resulted in the overthrow of democracy in many countries on the ground that nothing but dictatorship was strong enough to keep order or to make the far-reaching internal changes rendered necessary by these external pressures in these circumstances the calm and gradual discussion of social reform of the problem of reconciling the socialist and individualist ideals had become almost impossible Nation after nation, after plunging into a struggle between ruthless fascist and communist fascist, have succumbed to the dictatorship of one or another, with immense consequences, not only for their domestic life, but on the international front also. Yet the root cause of these disorders has been the anarchy of national sovereignties. 6. But it is when we turn to consider the consequences of national sovereignty on international political life that we begin to realize the full nature of the evil. The causes of war in the modern world are manifold unjust treaties, out-of-date treaties, the maltreatment of minorities or separation of minorities from the parent race, need for markets or raw materials, pressure for population or inadequate soil, racial, linguistic, cultural, or religious differences. But none of these causes of war compares with the consequences of national sovereignty itself. The most obvious effect of the anarchy of the national sovereignties is that of every international dispute whatever its origin, and it is discussed as a conflict between two or more sovereignties, and that there is no authority responsible for considering it or capable of legislating a solution for it, from the standpoint of the well-being of the whole. But an even more serious consequence of this anarchy is that where discussion does not produce agreement, there is no remedy but the threat of the use of force, and that is power diplomacy or war. Minor or justiciable matters may be referred to arbitration or international court, but no court can discharge the functions of a legislature, and matters which inside a state would be settled as a parliament or an executive on behalf of the whole can only be determined in international affairs by negotiation or diplomacy, or failing voluntary agreement, 
by violence between the parties. It is this central fact which produces the inexorable movement towards world war, with which history makes us so familiar. Not only are national states inclined to disagree because they look at every problem from their own point of view, but the possibility of their reaching agreement is made far more difficult by the fact that they have to consider every disputed question from the standpoint of their own security in the event of war. The objection to the Anschluss, for example, was not any desire to prevent Austrian Germans and German Germans uniting if they wanted to, but the fear of its effect on the strategic balance in Central Europe. And one of the principal reasons for the colonial expansion was the anxiety lest some other country would gain an advantage in power or strategic position, just as perhaps the principal difficulty in the way of colonial rearrangement today is its strategic consequence for the security of the nations concerned. But the trouble does not end there. Because every serious international question involves the possibility of war, nations, even the most pacific nations, arm themselves partly to ensure their rights will be respected, partly to make certain if war does break out, they'll be able to defend themselves. So the competition in armament sets in, for while no nation state wants to spend more money than is necessary on armaments, it wants to provide for its own security by having just the margin of superiority which will ensure that in the event of war, it will win and not lose. In other words, the security of every nation tends to depend upon the insecurity of its neighbors, and if a nation cannot obtain this security by its own strength alone, it will make alliances with others. As this process continues, the merits of every international question of importance become overlaid by considerations of strategy and power. Morality is dethroned by prestige and mock politics. Secrecy replaces open diplomacy, for, with war in the offing, there are facts and considerations which cannot be disclosed. The status quo becomes more and more unalterable, because the organization of security has come to depend on it. There may be a few minor adjustments made here and there, and in a crisis of power a particular nation may prefer the humiliation of retreat to the risk of war, but every such retreat makes retreat on the next occasion more and more difficult, and stimulates the competition in armaments. And finally, as armaments reach their limits and there are no more alliances to make, the terrible military timetable comes into being. The world, or a major part of it, becomes divided into two great armored camps each increasingly unable to look at international problems from the standpoint of reason and justice, each armed to the teeth and with its military preparation so complete that speed and mobilization, or in launching an air attack, may make the difference between victory and defeat. In such circumstances, the decision as to peace and war passes out of the hands of the statement, for a world war may be precipitated by an accident, a knave or a fool starting an act in some remote part of the world, which brings somewhere the vast and interrelated machinery of mobilization into action. This is what produced the War of 1914, for no one deliberately pressed the button for world war. The risks today have been made immeasurably greater by the existence of air power. While historians will debate to the end of time the distribution of responsibility for the late world war, there can be no doubt that the principal cause was the anarchy of national sovereignties. Europe had had a comparatively quiet century, for the nations were preoccupied with the Industrial Revolution in a world in which migration and trade was comparatively free, and in its own expansion over Asia and Africa. But gradually, national sovereignty began to close the door of trade. Colonial expansion began to be looked at more and more from the standpoint of strategy and power. The rise of a German navy was noticed that a new power had entered world politics, and crisis approached as the old absolute empires of Turkey and Austria-Hungary began to totter to their doom under the growing forces of nationality within them. Amid the growing tension which the race and armaments began, every diplomatic issue began to be a trial of strength. Europe became grouped into two great camps, and after one or two preliminary power crises, the assassination of Franz Ferdinand precipitated a mobilization which set in motion a military timetable whose inexorable operation no one could stop. It is exactly this same story since the war. Appalled by the catastrophe, the nations agreed at Paris to create a League of Nations out of which was to prevent war and adjust international disputes by pacific means. Its members undertook to submit all questions to judicial settlement, arbitration, and investigation by the Council or Assembly of the League. They agreed not to resort to war until they had given the pacific machinery of the League a full chance to work and to take sanctions against any power which went to war in disregard of its obligations. They agreed to disarm. Later, under the Kellogg Pact, they renounced altogether the use of war as an instrument of national policy, but national sovereignty has destroyed these sincere hopes. In the first place, the United States refused to join the League because of the onerous obligations in Europe it entailed. National interests prevailed over world organization. In the second place, the League has proved in practice unable to make any substantial revision of the Versailles status quo created by the treaty for the reason that no revision can be made except with the consent of the parties concerned 
and these parties think of the issue not only from a self-centered standpoint, but from the point of view of the effect of the proposal on their own security. The League without the United States became little more than part of the machinery for maintaining against Germany the unilateral discriminations contained in the Treaty of Versailles until the National Socialist Movement took the task of revision into its own forceful hands. In the third place, as been proved over the Manchurian and Abyssinian crises, the security offered by the Covenant against aggressors has broken down, because it's now clear that the economic sanctions are ineffective, unless they're both universally backed by readiness to go to war, and by an overwhelming preponderance in the event of war, that individual nations will only undertake such risks if their own national interests are vitally concerned. So as the exhaustion caused by war has disappeared, we see, despite the League, a recommencement of the same kind of events as precipitated the last war. The weak have had to yield to the strong. Rearmament has destroyed the hopes of disarmament. Alliances have reappeared, though sometimes they are disguised as covenant terms. Revision of treaties, which might have been easy while the world was exhausted and relatively disarmed, has become increasingly impossible as strategic security has begun to replace morality and justice, and mock politic has begun to replace open discussion as the motive of national policy. 7. It is difficult, therefore, to exaggerate the demonic consequences which flow from unlimited national sovereignty in the modern world. It has been the main root of economic nationalism which has caused the vast unemployment and capital losses through the cessation of international trade, the dislocation of the world balance between supply and demand, and the overthrow of democracy by dictatorship in country after country. It has been the remorseless enemy of the League of Nations, which is now compelling the world to come back to competitive armaments and alliances to the military timetable, made ten times more fatal today by air power. It is slowly compelling every nation not only to militarize itself in external relations, but in its internal life also, and is once more dethroning morality and right in favor of force. It is preventing the constitutional solution of the issue between socialism and individualism by turning it into a worldwide struggle between fascism and communism. It has been estimated by Nicholas Marie Butler that the last war, the War of National Sovereignties, cost 30 million lives and 80 billion pounds. With that amount, he has said, we could have built 500 pound houses with 200 pounds worth of furniture and placed it on five acres of land with 20 pounds an acre for every family in the United States. Canada, Australia, England, Wales, Ireland, Scotland, France, Belgium, Germany, and Russia. There would have been enough left over to give every city of 20,000 inhabitants and over, in all of these countries, a 1 million pound library and a 2 million pound university. Out of the balance, we could have set aside a sum of 5% interest, which would have paid for all time 200 pounds year salary for 125,000 teachers and 125,000 nurses. After having done all of this, we still could have bought up all of France and Belgium and everything they possessed in 1914, every home, factory, church, railway, and streetcar. That was the price paid for national sovereignty 20 years ago. What will be the price next time? 8. A League of Nations is no cure for this state of affairs. It has immense importance as representing mankind's first recognition for the need of world government and for the reign of law among nations. It creates excellent machinery for international deliberation and pacific settlement of international disputes, so long as all nations and members are willing to submit to its procedure. But because it's based on a complete national sovereignty of its members, it begins to be paralyzed as soon as one or more of the powerful states resign membership or repudiate their obligations under the covenant, for contract is utterly different from common sovereignty. No League of Sovereign States can establish peace in a political sense of the word. The reasons for this were exhaustively set forth in the pages of the Federalist, through which Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, and John Jay described to their fellow citizen how state sovereignty inexorably broke down the American Confederation of 1781, and why the pooling of a sovereignty in a federation actually achieved in 1789 was the only way to peace order in the reign of law in America. Europe and the world have exactly the same experience of the manner in which the state sovereignty has broken down the League of Nations since 1920. Because its members are sovereign, the League can exercise neither legislative, executive, judicial, nor taxing power. So long as there is a general acceptance of the political and economic status quo, the League system worked. But gradually, national sovereignty undermined it. It was unable to abate in the least economic nationalism, with all its fateful consequences. It could only alter the status quo with the voluntary consent of the most immediately concerned, which has not been obtainable. Collective security has almost vanished because economic sanctions are of little value unless universally applied. In military sanctions and even effective economic sanctions against a powerful sovereign state involve a risk of war which members are not prepared to assume unless their own vital interests are involved.
A League of Sovereign States, therefore, tends to become a system not for the revision of treaties in the interest of justice, but to become an alliance system of those who are interested in the status quo. The essential weakness of the League is disclosed in the fact that the allegiance of the citizen is owed to his own state and not to the League, and that when the views of the two conflict, it is the decision of his own state that he must obey. No system of cooperation can overcome the tremendous power of national sovereignty. There is indeed no ultimate remedy for the demonic evils which spring from national sovereignty, save the creation of a common sovereignty representing all men and nations by the pooling of that part of a state's sovereignty which deals with supranational matters into a world federation, a state which in its own sphere will command the allegiance of mankind, will be able to legislate for, judge, and tax everybody, and which will be responsible to everybody while leaving the national state freedom to deal with affairs in the national sphere. When such a body comes into being, then and only then will war end, and the perversions and destructions inherent in the competition of national sovereignties be ended on earth. Such a federation need not embrace the whole world from the start. It could commence with a smaller group of nations which understand the truth and then grow by accretion. Pacifism is no remedy for war, for it does nothing to substitute for the anarchy of sovereignties, which is the real cause of war, the single sovereignty which alone can end it. Pacifism only encourages the brutal force of violence. Armament is no cure for war, for while it may determine which side wins or whether democracy triumphs over dictatorship or vice versa, it also does nothing to end anarchy or abolish the fears and suspicions, the alliances and military timetable, which end in war. 9. What is the bearing of Christianity on the demonic evils which thus spring from the worship of national sovereignty? The federation of nations into a single world commonwealth may be a logical remedy, but it is not a practical remedy today. In fact, the creation of a world federation, either by force or by agreement, might lead to worse evils than those from which we now suffer. It would either be a tyranny so strict and repressive that freedom of thought and initiative and religion would almost certainly be destroyed, or it would be so weak that the differences in race, language, culture, and religion among its peoples would speedily tear it into pieces. All of the attempts to create peace by world empire have broken down through the atrophy which universal despotism induced in its subjects, in the corruption which arbitrary and absolute power induced in the rulers. That has been true of Egypt, Assyria, the Mughals, the Manchus, and the Roman Empire. Yet Christianity clearly cannot acquiesce in the claim of the national state, that it has a sovereign claim to the obedience of the citizen, whatever its commands may be that there is no higher loyalty or law than its own interest, that in fact it must be accorded the attributes of God. To the Christian man, loyalty is owed to God, whatever his race or culture or language may be, and it is this truth recognized in practice which alone began to bring unity and law and peace among the conflicting races and warring sovereignties which now claim the allegiance of mankind. It is love for and understanding of God which alone can create the conditions in which the federation of man will become a possibility, in which war and the demonic consequences of national sovereignty can be ended. For the manifestation of the spirit among men will lessen the egotism and nationalism, will weaken the hold of the despotic political creeds and pagan philosophies, and will substitute brotherly love and trust for envy, hatred, greed, and suspicion in international relations, both political and economic. It will mean a transformed human nature in which men and nations will not only feel their unity, but will be able to trust one another because they act with the same just and honorable and unselfish standards. When this Christian transformation of man through love and understanding of one true God has gone far enough, the nature and purposes of mankind will be so changed that it will be natural, easy, indeed inevitable to bring into being institutions which will deal with the international problems from the standpoint of the well-being of humanity as a whole, and whereby the legislative, executive, and judicial functions of the World Federation will be exercised under some kind of democratic control, and in accordance with the moral and spiritual law, and without any despotic, repressive, illiberal features which would necessarily characterize a world state today. For the Spirit of the Lord will inform its policy and its acts. And quote, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. It is certainly not the duty of the Church, as the vehicle through which Spirit reaches man, to advocate the creation of a federation of nations today. But the effective growth of Christianity in the minds and hearts of mankind will inevitably tend to bring such a consummation, with its ending of war and the demonism which springs from anarchy into being. We have already once in history witnessed the power of Christianity to begin to do this very thing. At the outset, Jesus refused to lend himself to the movement among the Jews which sought to break up the Roman Empire, and it was his refusal to surrender to nationalism which enabled the priests to rally the populace to the demand for the release of Barabbas in his own crucifixion. Thus, when asked whether his disciples should pay tribute to Caesar, he replied, 
Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. It is not reasonable to infer that Jesus understood the advantage to humanity of a universal empire, which for all its ruthlessness gave peace and reign of a fairly advanced system of law to the then civilized world, apart from India, China, and the Far East, and considered that it was the duty of Christians to transform it by the spirit they manifested, rather than to destroy it. Paul certainly thought so, and Christianity, not Judaism, eventually did conquer Rome, and in doing so tempered its brutality with tolerance and humanity. It did more. As the empire of Rome began to decay, as Greco-Roman culture became lifeless and wooden, as new cults from the Orient began to undermine the austere faith and morality of the older Roman society, as the empire began to break up under the ceaseless attacks of the uncivilized but vigorous barbarians from the north, Christianity itself became the unifying, civilizing, and humanizing power in a new society more extensive than the old. For centuries, savagery was tempered by the consciousness that Christendom was a unity and that civil power owed obedience to the higher law of God. But in its struggles, the Christian church lost its primitive simplicity. It put on the attributes of Caesar rather than of God and became concerned with the expediencies and compromises of the world. After Constantine, the attempt to identify church and state gradually involved the church in political divisions and conflicts, and it was the attempt of the church to maintain the unity of Christendom by turning the papacy into temporal Caesarism, compelling the state to use its police powers to suppress freedom of thought within itself, that finally precipitated the Reformation at the time of the Renaissance. So the unity of Christendom disappeared. As the authority of Christianity waned, new cults and creeds founded on material and not spiritual foundation began to raise their heads, the national state began to claim absolute allegiance which was no longer given to the universal church. The discoveries of natural science and the rediscovery of ancient philosophies and cultures began to restore secularism and paganism as the effective faith of the vast majority of the educated classes in the world. But the individual, selfish as he largely is, cannot live unto himself alone. He needs some loyalty for the sake of which he will lay down even his own life. For several centuries, the national state has been the main object for which, in practice, the mass of mankind has been willing to surrender their lives. Hence this anarchy, with all its demonic consequences in which we live today. And now new political religions, fascism and communism, are claiming a similar dedication for new forms of state. Nonetheless, though Christianity clearly needs to be revitalized, theology restated, it remains true, as a noted Oriental scholar has said, that all the real achievements of Western civilization, the respect for human personality, the humanitarian movement, the abolition of slavery, individual freedom, the emancipation of women, the ideal moral purity, the concept of social reform, the rise of democracy, the assault of war, the idea of the League of Nations, have all derived their greatest support and their greatest driving power from those who have drawn their courage and inspiration and devotion to God and man from the eternal springs of the Bible. Yet Christianity today stands confronted with a task greater than has ever been presented to it. It has to overcome not only the paganism and secularism of our age, but to overcome also the political and economic divisions of which the national state is most ruthless and powerful, which are tearing human society to pieces, making the practice of Christianity increasingly difficult, and driving mankind to demonism and wars, which are inseparable from anarchy. The ecumenical church of Christ will not do this, by becoming absorbed in the political and economic programs and ideals of the time. Neither will it do it by standing apart from the public questions of the age. Christianity produces as acute transformations and controversies in the body politic in which it is lived, as it does in the individual who begins to practice it. The church will accomplish its mission by being faithful to the unchanging spiritual law of God, rather than to the experiences of men, and by being the expression of that active and practical love and wisdom of God towards men, which once it is reflected in society, will inevitably produce the kingdom of God among the nations of the earth.